You're watching West Hartford Community Television. You're watching West Hartford Community Television. For the community, by the community. Hi, and thanks for this very special edition of One Guy and a Lot of Wine. My co-host is in Boston planning his wedding. Jim, I wish you the best, but I am very blessed and thankful that I have two great novices joining me tonight to taste some wine with some gadgets in a show that we're going to call Gadgets, Gizmos, and Wine, Oh My. And I'm very pleased to have Mr. Mason Hoban from the University of Harvard. Great to be here. And Jen Evans, Executive Director here at WHC-TV. I'm delighted to be here. And you have no idea how excited I am because generally, me and Jim will do this and we'll get a little technical. Now we're going to get right down to the nitty-gritty of it with people who don't really drink a lot of wine sure. to see if there is a difference in taste using some gadgets that are available out there on the market. And one of my favorite little gadgets, and tonight we're going to actually start off drinking a, a Sauvignon Blanc. Now, I don't know if... A Jen or Mason, you have any experience with a Sauvignon Blanc? Names mean nothing mean to Mean nothing me. to you. <laughs> nothing to me. It's a very citrusy white wine. It's not really a lot of flavor, but it's got a good profile if you'd like something simple with your white. Unlike a Chardonnay, which can be a little on the butter side or a little on the sweeter side, a Sauvignon Blanc will give you a little bit more of a zest, sort of like a, an orange juice type flavor. This one's from Napa Valley. It's a Sauvignon. Uh, it's moderately priced. It's under the $15 range. And we're going to start off tonight with our first gadget, which is the Vino Ice. Now, this has been chilling in the freezer. When you buy this, this is the box. Please feel free to check this out online if you're interested. You chill this in your freezer. And when you're ready to either serve a bottle of white wine or go out to one of your favorite BYOB restaurants here in town or other areas, you pour one glass. This goes right into the bottle, drops right in. Push it down, the collar locks, and you have this great little lip that'll keep the wine both chilled and safe. And Jen, uh, that'll keep it cool for about an hour or so. Wow. And uh, I'm sure Mason, uh, you probably yeah, can... that is very cool. That is definitely very cool. I know cool you're a beer guy. You might be able to put <laughs> that yeah, in a beer yeah, bottle. I wish, they, I wish they had something like that. <laughs> so we're going to try this first white tonight, which once again is a Napa Valley Sauvignon Blanc. So feel free to. Give it a little twirl or smell. See if you smell any citrusy flavors there. Oh, yeah. Do you get the citrus a little bit? Yeah, yeah. I can taste it. Now I find that very dry. That is dry. Now I like that because I tend to like dry. So I like that. What do you think, Mason? It's not bad. It's a little fruity. You can definitely taste the fruit. Yeah, it is a little fruity. Generally with a Sauvignon Blanc, you will get a tad bit of citrusy fruity, but it shouldn't be overpowering. Um, generally, when we've tasted numerous Sauvignon Blancs on the show, I tend to, because this is one that I'm familiar with, keep it a little bit on the drier side, because mm. that's just the way I particularly like it. And uh, when you have a white wine, Jen, do you have a preference yourself? I tend to like dry a drier wine in general. Now, what does dry mean? I'm not even sure what dry means. Sure. it's a, You're right it, when you say a dry wine. Um, if you drink a lot of white wines in particular, mm -hmm. some wines like a Chardonnay, and I usually stick to Chardonnay or Sauvignon Blancs because that's basically what we drink on the show. We sometimes do a Riesling. A Riesling would be a very, citru a very sweet wine, mm -hmm. which generally, uh, actually we did one on last month's show, and we had Manchester Community College on doing some of the tastings with food. You would pair that with a sweet type of food, whether okay. it be a chocolate or dessert. Uh, a dry wine just means you don't still have a lot of residual flavors in your mouth. Okay. So you probably notice if you take a sip of this, it doesn't linger too long on your mouth. You take a sip, no. it's a little bit on the tongue, mm -hmm. take a swallow, there's not a lot still going on right. there. And 
A lot of people prefer that with a white wine, especially if you're going to have something like a seafood meal or uh, shrimp, even some light chicken meals. Mm -hmm. Generally, you don't want to drink a Sauvignon Blanc with like a red sauce because the red sauce is a little overpowering. It right. might not be a good compliment to that type of food. And I think, Jim, we, were, we had the uh, gala, um, when was that, back in... Uh, October. 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 I know we had quite a few wines to choose from. And I think one of the whites that was a big success actually was a Chardonnay that night. Mm. I don't know if you had a chance to try the Chardonnay. I think I did. I think it was a flip-flop Chardonnay, I believe. Y yes, yes, I believe that's right. And that was very popular, but to me that was a little bit on the buttery side, so mm. it wasn't one of my favorites of the night. So you can find this locally. Feel free to do a search online. It's generally under the $15 price point. And the Vinoweiss contraption, you can find that online. I think that's under uh, $30, but just do some searching. This is great to have in your refrigerator for those occasions where you don't want to use a collar around the whole bottle, which sort of hides what you're drinking. And if mm -hmm. you're a wine snob, sometimes like I like to be, I want people to actually see the wine that I'm drinking. So they right. would say, oh, oh, Bob, that's a fancy bottle of wine. <laughs> um, with this, they could actually see the bottle and say, Bob, that's a nice bottle of wine. So why don't we finish up this? Feel free to chug it. It's okay. It's, it's not <laughs> right. a strong. Uh, you know. Nancy, would you normally serve this? You said you a dry wine in general would be paired with a chicken or something like that, or? Well, Jim's oh, rule with wine is a little different than mine. He says, "Drink what you like." Okay. Um, I also agree with that, but at the same time, a Sauvignon Blanc like this, I wouldn't serve this if I was having people over with pasta. If you were out for a red sauce meal at one of the Italian restaurants in the area or you're eating something very spicy. Actually, a spicy, that's not correct. Spicy will do very well with this. But a red sauce, like an Italian sauce, might be a little overpowering for this particular type of wine. So I would use this particular Sauvignon Blanc for either a spicy meal, like Thai food, if you like really mm -hmm. spicy Thai oh, food. Yeah. Um, that really cuts the spice right down. And it, especially if you like spicy duck. I'm a big fan of spicy duck. <laughs> so is so, it all about balancing the flavors? Generally it is. I mean, certain wines are not gonna taste good with certain foods. Like last uh, month when we did the pairings with different food, we tried wines that were specifically paired with that type of food. Mm. Then we mixed it up a little bit, and we tried the wine with food that you shouldn't be drinking with it. And I got to tell you, it was not pleasant. <laughs> oh, no. And it sort of ruined the whole experience of that particular hors d'oeuvre, mm. which by itself was delicious, but when paired with the wrong wine, not very good. Okay. So... I would say that was a very good Sauvignon Blanc. It was, it, was, it was very fine, I think. I've had this one before, so I'm a little biased. So mm -hmm. um, you two would either thumbs up, thumbs down, middle of the road, or just it indifferent. Was, it was probably about middle of the road for me. I, I'd give it a thumbs up, yeah. personally. Cause I, I mean, I, but I tend to like a drier wine, and mm -hmm. it wasn't too fruity for me. I, but there was a hint of it, which I, I did like that. Also, so. gadget number two, which is around this bottle, is another little thing you can get online, which is great to also have. It's called the wine thermometer. It's a stainless steel collar that'll go around any bottle of wine, uh, whether it's a red or white, and within a matter of moments tell you the temperature. Um, this temperature on this particular bottle, I think is registering at 57 degrees. It's been sitting out a little longer than it should be, and I just put the chiller in there. But it's great to have if you have the people of your house that are really into wine and don't want to be served either a warm wine or a cold wine and you want to have the temperature exactly where it should be, that's a great little gadget to have. Once again, do a search online, phenomenal. All right, and then how would you know what temperature necessarily you wanted it to be at, yes. just as a rule? On the collar, I don't know if the camera can pick it up, but just let me show Jen really quick. It'll tell you the different types of wine. Oh, look at that. Where the temperature should be. So you have the burgundies here, you have the Chiantis, mediums, the dry whites. It lists a variety of wines as to what the general range of temperature should be. It's just another way, great way of showing off to your friends that you know a little bit about the wine, <laughs> which we like to do. So Right, and it seems like it's a no-brainer for getting the uh, right, it at the correct temperature. Yeah. It is. Never, it, that's kind of helps you if you don't know. Right. That's what's great about it. It's a really one, two, three operation. Buy it, take it out of the box, stick it on the bottle. And it tells you exactly what the temperature is and what range it should be. And it's not always the case that you need to drink it what the temperature range is for that particular Sauvignon Blanc. That could sit out probably for a little bit longer, even if it was room temperature, I think mm. it would still be enjoyable to, mm -hmm. uh, to drink. And actually, uh, Mason, we're gonna get into later on about you like some porters and beer. Absolutely, and that's I'm another a big example fan of, of dark beer. Room temperature beers. Oh yeah, it gets very funny. Yes. Yeah. So now we're gonna get into the really controversial part of the evening. 
And I've been oh. waiting for this. <laughs> and they can only come from Italy. The Italians are always causing controversy, though I love Italian wines. These two glasses, those of you who are familiar with our Rito show that we did a couple months back, and if you do remember, there, there was a spectacular difference in the flavor of a Rito glass and a regular wine glass. So I took it up another notch. I said, what else is on the market which is going to taste or make the taste of wine affect it in a positive way or a negative way? And I found, or I should say, my wife Carrie found, these great aerating wine glasses, direct from Italy, uh, Amici. They are scientifically designed with these ridges inside the glass. So when you pour the wine, specifically red wine, into the glass, and you twirl it, like us wine people like to do, <laughs> for a few seconds, it not only aerates the wine, but it also disperses and slightly decreases the alcohol content of the wine. Now, has that been scientifically tested in America? <laughs> How could that be? No. <laughs> has it been scientifically tested in Italy? Yes. So for really? this, yes, for this <laughs> particular experiment, we're going to rely on the Italians to see if they are telling the truth. Now, okay. we can't tell you about the alcohol because we don't have a breath in that analyzer. So, we're going to start off with the first red tonight, which is a phenomenal little Constillo Monserrat. And this is a Spanish Grenache. And I've had this probably several times over the last four or five months. I think this is a great wine to try with these glasses. It's a little heavier wine. So by aerating the wine in these glasses, and then drinking the same wine in these two glasses, we should get a significant difference in flavor. We shall see. All right. Excited. Now you can already see it's a very dark wine. Mm -hmm. Now you said that you've had this a couple times. I've is this had one this of your couple favorites? Times. One of your personal favorites? Uh, I like a lot of Spanish wine. Our next wine is going to be an Argentinian wine, which I tend to like a lot also. And. Um, you generally can't go wrong with a Spanish or Argentinian wine because the flavor is there. They're relatively inexpensive, though there are some expensive ones out there. Um, in general, the flavor is really always good for a Spanish wine. Um, it's not overly complex. So I would say, Jen, okay. Mason, take a sip out of the first glass first. Okay. Okay. Small sip, nothing too uh, major. Smooth. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Then you would slide these off to the side. Okay. And you will take these and spin them in a counterclockwise way. Hold it by the base and just sort oh. of go like that. Okay. You can do it pretty vigorously. Okay. It's making noise. Oh, I'm yep. sorry. Yes, <laughs> actually. The other counterclockwise. I don't know if the camera can pick that up, but it is making a noise. It is. It's kind of cool. That should tell you something is occurring in that glass. Now, <laughs> scientifically, there is something occurring in that glass. The grooves are dispersing and opening up the wine. That is what an aerator does to begin with, if you have one of those glass ones that you pour the wine in. You I can think see it is, it is making a bubble. Yep. That is supposedly the, how the alcohol has decreased a little bit. Once again, don't know that for sure. So why don't you give that a sip and see if you taste it, taste any different at all compared to the, uh, the first one we had. It does. A little bit. It's, I think it's dramatically different. Do you? Maybe I should take a sip of this no, one. No, no, I need to check yeah, again. Yeah, do a, a balance back and forth. And this uh, particular wine is an 88-pointer from a Wine Spectator. And uh, the former, or the person who actually runs the vineyard, is a former bullfighter. And he got into the winemaking business uh, a few years back. And he's been getting some great reviews and has uh, been producing some phenomenal wines. And uh, as a former bullfighter, I'm not going to disagree. It does. It almost tastes lighter out of this one. That's what I was going to say, yeah. too. It's like the end taste, the finish, I guess that's that what they call would call the that finish. the finish, yes. the yep. is, is stronger on, in this glass yes. and lighter. It's like you, don't, you yeah. don't taste the finish. Definitely. No, I would say the exact same thing. Now, as a relatively both novices, do you have a particular flavor that you pick up when you drink this wine? Are you tasting like, a, I don't want to put words in your mouth, like a cherry or maybe a... Um, cinnamon, or is there anything that sticks out at you? Like if you if you took a sip of this wine, somebody said, "What does it taste like?" Not really sure. I, I, I can I... see the I I can see sort of like a black cherry kind of taste. I guess the uh, fa flavor profile they say is a burnt cherry, ah. sort of an espresso, 
<laughs> and uh, I even have cedar down as one of the oh, uh, flavor yes. profiles. Now that you say it. And a lot of times, you know, I, I try to avoid doing that until people have tasted the wine because I don't want to put words in your mouth. Mm -hmm. mm. And a lot of times, who the heck knows what cedar tastes like? Exactly. Mason, how many times you put cedar in your mouth? Only once. Yes, that's right. <laughs> your, your mother probably smashed it when you did it. <laughs> so uh, it's one of those things where, um, you know, if you become familiar with wine, uh, a lot of people talk about, like, do you taste this profile or that profile? Jim actually has a kit that has over 100 profiles of flavor chips that you would taste to compare different wines to. Now, we haven't used it yet on the show because uh, I feel that if I bring that on the show, I have to have a pipe and a bow tie on to talk about <laughs> it. So we're holding off on that for a future show. So. All right. Now, you can pour your excess wine into one of these glasses if you can't finish it all, and then we'll move over to uh, the third wine shortly. But if you want to finish that, <laughs> right off the bat, you are more than welcome to. I did like this one better than the first one, though. The first personally, wine? Personally, personally. Well, what's great when, you know, um, when you get into wine, and I sort of, when I started wine, I sort of, I think I started off with Australian wines. But Spanish wines, yeah, you could pour it right in there. Spanish wines are good because they're not overly in-your-face, bold, and direct. So especially if you don't like anything that's too rich or too powerful, you could never go wrong with a Spanish wine. Mm -hmm. As you can see, it's very easy to drink. Yep. It's yep. very smooth. It's the kind of wine that the reason it's popular is because you can sort of sit and drink that for a long period of time, mm -hmm. sipping it. For someone who never drinks wine, it's definitely not overpowering. Yep. yep. It is very smooth, very easy to drink. And uh, when we get into the Argentinian wine, which is coming up next, you should definitely get a different opinion as to the flavor of that wine because how the grapes were grown is completely different than how the grapes were grown on the Spanish wine. The uh, wine that's coming up next, which is an Argentinian rich blend, is actually grown in some of the highest, driest, and sunniest regions in the world in Argentina. So there should be a distinct different flavor with this baby. Okay. I'll, I'll pour smaller this time. So it makes a difference, obviously, where the grapes and how they're... The where the grapes are grown, what varieties, what the terroir is, mm -hmm. the soil makes a huge difference on wine. And especially when it comes to temperature, because temperatures make a huge difference in grapes. And depending on, like here in Connecticut, you know, we do produce some wine. We don't produce a lot of our own, 100% of our own wine because we don't have the temperature climate that's mm -hmm. conducive to it. Mm -hmm. So I miss my own glass. Like when you go to the store, Jim, what do you normally buy if you have people coming over the house? Do you just ask the person in the store to give you a hand? Uh, yes. I mean, I, I have to admit, I mean, I'm from upstate New York, so, I mean, we used to drink Taylor wine and uh, Bully Hill and that kind of along those, like, non-local upstate New York vineyards. Well, actually, the Finger Lake region in New York is famous for their Rieslings. Some of the best Rieslings actually in the United States come from, uh, it's yeah. one of the regions, the Finger Lake areas. So. So let's try it with our first wine glass. Little smell. That seems a little creamier to me. Mm -hmm. yeah. Definitely a stronger aftertaste. And actually, we've talked about this in the show before. You can see the legs of the wine. See how it sticks to the glass a little bit? Oh, yeah. That usually always means it's a thicker wine, it's more of a heavier wine. So the aerating glasses should make a difference when you give it a spin. All right. <laughs> Great TV. <laughs> did it do anything this time? Yep, it did for me. It did. It tastes dramatically. This one, I think, the other, the difference in the taste changed, but this time I feel like it tastes better in this glass. I mean, better being just richer and... Well, you know, when I got the glasses, I knew how they were designed was going to make a difference in the wine flavor. So it's good to see somebody who doesn't have a lot of experience with wine notice it that directly because that's actually the concept of the glass. I mean, ah. you want it to change the flavor of the wine. You want it to aerate the wine. You want it to open it up. So obviously it's doing its job. So if you had to pick the two versions of the red tonight, would you prefer mainly aerating glasses or the standard wine glasses? 
Definitely the aerating glasses for me. All right, great. I think it's odd. I, I think the aerating glass for the second wine, but the first wine, I liked better in the regular glass. Yeah, the, isn't I mean, that the is white that wine? Is that odd? Or the first red wine? Yeah. Oh, so you the like first the first red. That's interesting. That's good then. See, there's no set rules for wine tasting and how you like it. So when the wine was opened up in the aerating glasses, it didn't agree with you as much as it did in the first glass. You sort of liked it just in the standard wine glass. Yeah, uh, yeah. there was something about the... I, I didn't like that it it lost that finish. I liked the finish in the, from mm -hmm. the first time around anyway. And then when I drank it... But the second one is it's dr pretty dramatically better to me. Now, Mason, I know you're a beer guy. Right. And I know you uh, drink... Uh, porters and stuff like that. Yep. And we're thinking of doing actually a beer show, which is, a beer is very similar to one in a lot of ways because the profiles, flavor profiles. What are some of the beers you've had experience with that you've enjoyed over the last uh, year or so? Uh, my favorite beer that I found is actually brewed in Detroit by Atwater Brewery. They made a vanilla Java porter, and that was probably, actually maybe the fav my favorite beer I've found so far. Um, you know, I've, I've had so many porters, it's hard to remember. Them. Mostly coffee porters. I really like if they either have a hint of coffee or a hint of vanilla or maybe a hint of chocolate. Those are the kinds that I really tr try and strive to get. Well, what's great is, I mean, the, the craft beer industry has really taken off. Right. So one of the things that I've talked to Jim about is, I mean, because I have some friends that actually uh, not only make their own beer, but collect different types of beer from all over the country mm. and even the world. And to do a, a flavor profile of beer is just as enjoyable as sometimes as wine. Absolutely, it is, it is just as different. Do you prefer your beers cold though? Do you prefer oh, absolutely, the, absolutely. So I know there are some, uh, those Irish, uh, the Guinness there that... Uh, Not me, I like my Guinness cold too. Oh, you like your Guinness cold too? <laughs> absolutely. Well, this is one that we don't need cold, but it's, out of the three tonight, I would probably say the Cold de Sol is probably my favorite. Mm -hmm. um, that's just me though. Mm -hmm. And, for the red for you, Jenny, I think you said you liked the first one, which actually was the, the bullfighter. Yes, I did. I liked the first one. You know, I think I would have to go with the middle one. The bullfighter. Yep. All right, the bullfighter is <laughs> making a good wine. <laughs> <laughs> so are there any good upcoming events here in, uh, for the uh, station? Oh, you know, it's, it's kind of since, interesting since we're actually toasting here. We're, the station is uh, going to be... Uh, working and collaborating with the Playhouse on Park to uh, have a toast to Rob Rolson, which is a special event uh, on Thursday, June 27th at 5.30 right here in Town Hall. And uh, Rob has uh, worked here as the community, the connection between the community and businesses and the town um, for many, many years, and he's retiring and um, we're so delighted he, that he's willing to uh, let us roast and toast him. It's so. always good to roast and toast people. <laughs> it is always good for that. So we're, we're, we're really going to you know, take some time to celebrate like, the great work that he's done and just really um, have fine food or just easy hours, you know, come in, go out, you know, uh, get a chance to chat with Rob, and we're going to have all kinds of you know, WHCTV surprises like we, we usually do, you know, to kind of make the evening special, so. And I know, Mason, uh, you're an intern here at the station. Yep. So uh, I know Jatu's probably been doing a good job with you. Uh, Absolutely. What are the, one of the reasons you wanted to, to be an intern here? Um, truthfully, you know, I really wanted to get into the sports media world. So uh, obviously TV is a huge part of that. So I figured, you know, a local, local station would be able to take me on and show me the ropes and actually have me do practical things. And I would definitely say that I, I've gotten a hands-on experience here. Well, it's a great station. That's why we've enjoyed doing absolutely, the show for yeah, as long as we have. And actually, you know, I just realized I forgot one of our other little gadgets. Oh, now what is that? Now this is another little contraption that you would actually chill in your freezer. And when you were going out either to a friend's house or to a restaurant, BYOB of course, you would put the bottle right in there and that would ah. keep it cold for about two hours. Now, it's not quite as fancy as the Obviously. vino ice right. chill rod, but uh, it does the same thing. And that's one thing that I think for people that if you're looking to find gadgets or doodads for your wine collection or just in general, you know, do some experimentation online because there's so many things out there that you can enjoy and uh, add to your wine collection. And, you know, I'm thinking about adding a few more of these swirly glasses to my wine collection because I think it's worked out tonight. 
I definitely noticed a change in flavor. Yeah, I, I have to say that, you know, the glass really did change the taste dramatically. And, you know, it just, it's just a cool looking glass. <laughs> On top of everything else. And it's made it in just, Italy. The sound exactly, it makes. It's you know? Italy. <laughs> the sound it makes is also The sound cool. is pretty neat, too. I don't know if the camera, if the audio can pick I that up. So. But it, I actually think the camera picked up that sound on that. Because it's, it's, it's pretty cool. You know, it, I should say that you, you can't do it with white, but that's probably not exactly correct. Because if you want to disperse the alcohol, like according to the Italians it does, you could use this for a white by swirling it around and dispersing the, the wine a little bit, it will decrease the alcohol. I want to say though, don't use that as an, as an excuse to drink excessively <laughs> and uh, think that, you know, two guys in a lot of wine say, buy these glasses, swirl, and you can drink to your heart's content. Because right. no. that's really not the, the, uh, the point of the glass. The point of the glass is to give a person the option of aerating the, glass, aerating the wine rather than using one of those large decanters which take up so much room and can be very top heavy. And I've actually had somebody hit one and smash to the ground. Which was not pleasant. So it just doesn't. I mean, is this something obviously you'd wash by hand, right? Uh, well, I mean, I mean, would, it, would it affect the? Jim and I disagree a little bit on this. He is a strong su uh, supporter of cleaning glasses, especially wine glasses, with either a special cleaner, which has no odor, so it doesn't transfer any odor to the glass, or doesn't tarnish the glass in any way. Like he does not believe in putting glasses in a dishwasher. I think you can put a glass in a dishwasher providing you use a pretty well-known dish detergent and not something like, you know, from the dollar store or something like that. Um, generally, when it comes out of the dishwasher, just give it a smell. If it has any type of smell, I would just give it a quick rinse under the sink and maybe towel dry it on the inside because you don't want to transfer any weird odors from whatever you were washing them in into the glass. Yeah. I know, like, you say you like drinking beer. I mean, I've seen so many different type of beer glasses. Absolutely. Which is the same principle, sort of. Pretty much, yeah, I know. Every different beer is supposed to be served in a different kind of glass. I've heard that. Even when you go to the bars, they give you all different kinds of glasses based off of whatever beer you get. And what is the theory behind the different sizes? Just, uh... I truthfully have no idea. I couldn't, I couldn't <laughs> tell you. Well, you must be very excited because I think, is it Samuel Adams that's coming out with the can that the whole top comes off? And really? you actually drink the can like a glass. I haven't, I haven't seen that. I haven't yeah, I'm that. not sure if it was Samuel Adams, but it's one of the uh, manufacturers where the beer can, the whole top comes off with a special edge so you won't you know, cut yourself. And it's just like drinking out of a glass. Well, I want to thank you both for filling in at the last minute like this. And Jim, I certainly hope you're enjoying yourself up there in Boston. <laughs> That's right, Jim. With Beth. Oh, <laughs> thank you. And uh, once again, thank you so much, Jen. Absolutely. Mason, thank you so much for, thank you for having me. tasting some wine with me. Absolutely. And until next time, though I'm only one guy in a lot of wine, join us for two guys in a lot of wine and keep me in your wine cellar. <laughs>